Our next interview is with Helen Younger of Aleph Bed Books. And um, Helen, I've known you for a long time, I've known your husband for a long time, but I think a lot of people would like to know what's your background, where do you come from, or, you know, what is your educational background, family background, what got you interested in the book business, and you know, uh, some background. Okay. I grew up in New Rochelle, New York, uh, which is a suburb of New York City. Went through high school there, and when it came time for college, I decided I wanted to get out of the New York area. I had enough of New York attitude, so I went to Washington University in St. Louis. And the year that I went was the year that they decided to expand their base of, you know, students, so a third of my class was from New York. Hmm. So the whole thing was, didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> After college, I backpacked around Europe and went and ended up in Israel. I stayed there for six months, worked on a kibbutz, worked in the melon fields. It was a great experience for me just to get a direct, you got a direct result from planting the melons to eating the melons. It was a very back-to-earth, back-to-basic kind of existence. And when I left there, I came home. I didn't know what I was going to do. And I decided I would go to graduate school. My mother said, why don't you become a librarian? So I said, okay, because I've always loved books. So I applied to Columbia University and Queens College. I got into Columbia, and I went there for a year and a half. I graduated as a reference librarian. What year was that? Just oh, for, do you remember what was that? Do you remember when the year you were in Israel, for example? Were you a teenager? I graduated from college in 1970, and I stayed around there. It was probably 72 that I graduated from Columbia. Okay. In the middle of that, I got married to Mark. Um, Mark was actually my math tutor because <laughs> when I decided to go to graduate school, I hadn't taken math for about eight years and he was a math teacher at the time. And my parents and Mark's parents were best friends. So I had come back from Europe and Mark's parents were having dinner over at my house and Mark walked in and Mark's mother said, why don't you have Mark tutor you in, in math? And I said, okay. So he started tutoring me, and he started tutoring me in August, and we decided to get married in November. Wow. And we got married the following April. So he was teaching math at the time, and I was in graduate school. I finished graduate school, and I got a job at the American Institute of CPAs Library. Wow. And I was indexing accounting magazines. It's very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like it. And the accountants all treated the librarians. You know, Sweetie, would you please go get a magazine for me? And honey, would you look up something for me? And that, that didn't sit well for me. After having a master's degree, the pay was horrible. Um, and my mother-in-law used to do estate sales in Westchester County. She would go into people's homes, and not garage sales with junk, she would mark the entire house, you know, with antiques, whatever they had, and people would come in and buy the furniture on site, you know? And she always saw people coming in and buying the books. And she said to me, you should do this. You should buy the books. People are always coming in and buying books. I said, I don't know anything about that. So she kept nagging at me. I was very discontented with being a librarian because of the, really, you got no respect. Yeah. Like, what's his name, that comedian? You know, I don't get no respect. Rodney Dangerfield. Poor Rodney. We, yeah, no money and no respect. <laughs> so one day I decided I would do it. So, and she had, unbeknownst to me, put aside about 40 children's books over the years from the various sales that she had done, because she liked them. So she gave me those as a starter, so I said, okay, I'll be a children's book dealer. And this was the time when you could buy these books for a dime. Yeah. And you would sell them for $25 so you could make your mistakes very cheaply. 
you could buy cheaply, and if you made a mistake, it didn't cost a lot of money. So what I did was I bought all kinds of books, put the children's books aside, and started learning on my own what the values were, what was collectible. I wrote away for catalogs. I would go to people's store. I went to Milton Reisman's store, Victoria Bookshop. He was probably the first children's book dealer. Yeah. And I, had them, I made the mistake of saying to him, I love your catalogs. I learned so much about what to price books. And I thought I was complimenting him. And since then, I've heard that so many times, yeah. and it's very annoying. But that's how I learned. And then gradually, I decided I would not sell generally, and just I sold books through the AB, Bookman's Weekly. Sure. Um, I'd go to a library sale and buy a book for a quarter, and then price it $12. And really, in a very short time, I realized someone else is buying that and selling it to someone else for more money. Why shouldn't I be that person? Yeah. So it's easier to do that if you're a specialist. And so I decided not to do general books, just do children's books. And um, gradually, that's, that's what happened. Did you ever have a shop, an open shop? No, we never had an open shop. There were times when we thought it would be great to do. But, you know, a shop in New York City, and I mean, our kinds of books are very popular in California. Oh, yeah. yeah. And so we thought maybe in L.A. or Beverly Hills, that would be a good place to have a shop. But we, it just it ties you down too much. And we, have a, we had a son. At the time when I went into business, he was two and a half. <laughs> and so we didn't want to be tied down like that. Uh, when you first started in the trade, were there any uh, booksellers who you sort of looked up to or who helped you or who were mentors? Or really only one, Justin Schiller was the one who was the, he was the kindest to me and he introduced me to um, some of the major collectors, very, you know, it was very generous of him to do that. Um, but I never asked other dealers for help in identifying books or pricing books. I just felt it was my responsibility to do it. To do it on your own. Yeah. And I also learned a lesson very early that if you ask another dealer for help, <coughs> then you have to offer them the book. That's usually the way it works, isn't and, it? Well, a lot of people don't realize that. Mm -hmm. And you have to offer them at a book at a, a price that they can make money. I learned that early, and I'm very grateful that I, I learned it, so I didn't antagonize many people. When the Internet came along, Helen, did you find it to be an easy transition for your firm, or was it tough? Well, I should, you should back up a little bit, okay. because um, Mark came into, Mark graduated from being a math teacher to doing, uh, we were only married, he was only a math teacher for a year, and then he went into computers to, yeah. you know, writing code and being a systems analyst. And in 1983, he wrote a, um, a system for, when personal computers came out, he wrote a, a, a database system for book dealers. I think I you subscribed. use it, right? I was a subscriber. And so I, I grudgingly got a computer. I didn't want one. I came home one day, and my desk was cleared off, and there was a computer on it, and I was, I was furious. <laughs> so, and I had my little card index behind me, and it was probably 10 years before I threw those cards out, and I thought, okay, the computer is here to stay. So he wrote this system, and our whole stock very quickly was on, you know, on the computer, and we were able to match customers with books and all of that. Bookies. What, yeah, what bookies. Was bookies was the way it was called. And I still use bookies now. He wrote it in 1983, and then he updated it in probably 1988. And I still use it now in 2007. Yeah, That's how brilliant, you know. Oh, no, it was. Uh, it was a brilliant yeah. program. Way, no, no one really knew what he was talking about at, right. the, at the outset. Um, so it was so revolutionary and so unusual. But the fact that I still use it is a testament, I think. I mean, it's still, there are things now that you can do that you couldn't do then. Yeah. Um, and 
I can, you can't do that with his system, but I still use it. So when the internet came, it was it was nothing. It was a natural step he for me. He just sort of just rolled right into it. Yeah, and, and I, I saw that um, this was here to stay, for good or bad. How has it affected your business? Um, have you Has it been, um, like many say, I've found customers I would have never found without the internet. I've sold books that I would have never sold without the internet. Is that your experience yeah, absolutely. as well? Yeah, absolutely. And for me, because I have, um, I have muscular dystrophy and I can't walk anymore. So when I started in the business, everything was traveling and going to bookstores and going to specialist dealer houses and up and down the stairs and That's you know rough. schlepping all over the place. And as you know, I got more disabled, the internet came along, and for me, it couldn't, it couldn't be better. Yeah. I can buy on the internet, I can sell on the internet, I do two fairs a year, so I've cut back a lot on the book yeah. fairs, but book fairs have also declined, so it's been perfect for me. And we have lost customers to the internet who feel that they can do better on their own. They're not, but they think they can. Um, and so it's been an overall plus for me, I think. Um, when you say that uh, you do two book fairs a year, well, obviously you do the New York book fair. What's the other book fair that the, you do? The other ABAA fair. I would only I do the California book fair. Okay, the uh, the California and and New York. Right. Do, do you is there some kind of a uh, pecking order? Would you say uh, would you say New York is better or California is better? Is it a coefficient of what you have at the moment? New York is always my best fair. Um, and we also, until last year, we always did uh, Boston, but I just cut back on fairs. Yeah. But those, t California and New York are 20% of our income, you know, our yearly income. So I don't want to give those up. And the, the balance of your business comes from the internet, or do you issue catalogs? So the balance comes, I mean, I'd say the internet's 10%. Catalogs are. Um, seventy percent, and book fairs are twenty percent. So uh, you you don't uh, do you have people come to your house to buy things or yeah, by I appointment mean, I, only I would imagine. Yes, and that would that sort of end with the catalog. I mean that's a small percentage, um, but people do come to the house. Uh, the in the past ten or fifteen years we've seen a, a radical change in book selling, not only with the internet but a lot of shops have closed all over the country, yeah. not just in, in our area, but all over. And um, I'm wondering, does this, this have an effect, adverse or positive, on your business, with bookstores all closing? Does it make yeah. any difference where you sit? No, it hasn't affected me. Um, I mean, I, I could see people saying that the, because there are fewer bookstores, and then the, um, the idea of buying rare books or used books or collectible books might be not as noticeable, it's not as visible to people, but that's one area where the internet has, it's really taken over. I mean, I think selling books on the internet is one of the most uh, successful, you know, businesses that there are for the internet. So I don't, it hasn't affected me. So it hasn't affected you at no. all? Uh, and of course, you said because of your uh, physical problem, uh, you find that the internet is excellent. It's for, been great for, for you. me. Yeah. yeah. Um, as you as you go on, you say you do two book fairs. Do you ever do? Did you ever do any of the regional book fairs other than ABAA? When you oh yeah. Were, and I've noticed lately that those have, in the last few years, have dropped off dramatically as well. That's only that's completely due to the internet. Yeah, I, I would think so. Uh, for example, in, in the Myriad, the Boston Association, we used to have 120 exhibitors and 10 people on the waiting list. Now we've got 40 exhibitors and nobody on the waiting list. But they they did that to themselves. Yeah. It's not. Um, it's what happened is that I'm sure people have said this that you've spoken to already, because the prices are out there. Dealers who um, who would do the smaller regional fairs used to price their books lower. So they would sell them, and they do very well at those fairs. Regular customers would buy them, and dealers would buy them. Now, everybody looks up the prices on the internet. They price their books 
at the highest possible point. And when they go to do these fairs, no one can afford to buy them. So they drop out of the, doing the fairs, and then the fairs disappear. Disappear. Um, how do you respond to the statement that uh, coming into the book business, one can get an instant education by using the internet? Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> Elaborate. I mean, the only way to, to learn about books is to handle them. And I mean, I see people describing books. They'll say, I've never had this book before. <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean? I mean, I, I don't how know. long have they been in business? How many? I mean, that's what I, I have a little um, essay on my website about. We won. We put a website up in 1993, and I wrote this essay. And part of it was um, how to buy on the internet and what to watch out for. And now it's 14 years later, and nothing has changed. Yeah, no, it hasn't. And 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 people are still buying books. There's a whole slew of people out there buying books that they think are first editions, that aren't first editions. And I don't know if what's going to happen when they go to sell them. Yeah. You know, their books won't have any value. On the other hand, there are other books that have become collectible that weren't collectible before, like ex-library books. Oh, yeah. Which is bizarre to me, but people are paying a lot of money for used books from the library, hundreds of dollars. Yeah. And there's a good market for those out there. There is. And you can't say that they're not collectible because they are collectible because people are paying for them. It's just their condition uh, may leave a lot to be desired. But that's only this little group of ours that are saying, oh, that condition is no good, when there might be huge numbers of those people out there who are buying those books. So who's to say what's collectible and what's not collectible? How does the um, auction uh, market fit into your scheme of things? Do you, are you an auction buyer? Yeah. Okay. You don't do anything <laughs> at auction. I can't. I'd love to buy at auction. I used to be able to buy at auction. But not anymore because of the anymore. prices. Yeah. And they just, they seem to be astronomical in all fields. And then you try, you try to sell a book that you have for half of what it goes for at auction, and it doesn't go. People won't buy it. Why do you suppose that there's this, this adamancy towards buying a, a nice copy of a book they couldn't get at twice the price, and they can buy it at half the price from you? Why wouldn't they want to do because that? Because there's a basic mistrust um, when you buy from a dealer. They think that we go to garage sales and buy our books for a quarter and then price them $5,000. So if they buy them at auction, that means there's an underbidder and there's somebody else who's willing to pay that amount so they feel better about it themselves. They're not necessarily getting a good deal. No. But in their eyes, they, they feel like... They, they feel better about it. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, everybody it legitimizes the what they're paying. Um, if you were going to get into the book trade today, Helen, is there some specific thing that you would need to have, that you would want to have before you took the jump? Well, Other than money. Right. <laughs> Other than money, which we all know is, you know, part of it. I think, I mean, I, I, I've never been to the, the seminar that they have out in Colorado, but I think now that's the thing to do if you're going to start. Yeah. And that teaches you the basics. If that, if that had been around when I was starting, that's what I would do. Unfortunately, it, there was nothing there no, that, back that, then. It, you know, we, the seminar has graduated probably 1,500 People. That many? But of that 1,500, there are probably less than 100 who, uh, who have stayed with the, books, with the book trade. Well, because everyone thinks it's easy. Yeah. I, I thought it was easy, too, when I yeah. first started. But, you know, well, three days easy. later, you know, you know better. It's easy if you, know what you're, if you have an instinct. You have to have an instinct, and that's the bottom line. You're either born with it? Yeah, I think so. Because you can't go to school to learn it. Right. Uh, this Herbert Reichmann, the German bookseller, used to have this long German phrase, Fingergespritzen, whatever the heck it is, which means if you touch the book, you it's should be able to, to find the price, but, right. uh, which is, you know, one philosophy. Um, what do you think are some of the major um, things that are facing the book trade today? I mean, we're, we're an established trade, yet 
there are still challenges that we're going to have to face in the years to come. It's just getting our name out there. I mean, that's really what, I think that's what we should be spending all of our uh, resources on, is impressing people on the internet that we're the people to come to, to buy books, because we know what we're doing. And, and we, we stand behind. Time, and we guarantee our books. None of this uh, all sales final yeah. kind of business. Yeah. I think that's a huge problem yeah. uh, with young people getting into the trade today. I think they rely too much on what they read in the internet and not enough of what they read in their head and their heart. I mean, they use eBay as you know, the benchmark for describing books and for pricing books and for you know, their standards. And you know, they will say, please read carefully. All sales final. You know, don't bid if you don't want it. <laughs> that's, that's pretty bad advice, I, I right. think. Uh, one of the things that I, I also like to, to sort of try to find out is if you had a crystal ball in front of you and you could look into the future, do you see a trade 50, 75, 100 years from now? Hmm, I don't think so. You don't think so? But where, do you see, where do you see the trade heading? Is it a direction downward? level? Or? Well, there are not very many young ABAA dealers. Um, and you really need a healthy organization to keep this part of the trade going. There'll be book trade, and it'll probably just be on the internet, and the, I would guess. So you see a future without any open book shows, stores? The expense well, of That's very sad to think. But when you think in terms of what it costs, for example, uh, Natalie Bowman was here a few minutes ago, and she has this shop on Madison Avenue. That must be an extremely expensive proposition. I know, I do that. And it's not just even the money. It's the hours in the day. You staff. know, just, right. Training the staff and then watching over the staff and then getting enough books to fill a store. It seems like a daunting proposition to yeah, me. Yeah, no, I admire them, really. Uh, yeah. Um, and I tell you, with Heritage going out of business... Well, I, they're not going out of business. I mean, closing their shop. Yeah. Well, that's, that's huge. It's, a, it's, it's really huge. I don't think people are um, really realizing the impact that that's going to have. I mean, they're, they're voracious buyers, and they serve a market that demands a certain kind of right. book. And if that, that entity isn't there to supply that book, um, you know, th there's going to be a void created. And they're very visible, and they, oh, yeah. they really promoted book collecting in, um, in California, you know? Absolutely. Um, you know, I've always felt that a, a book fair is a two-edged sword if you're an exhibitor. You have an opportunity to sell, you have an opportunity to buy. Um, do you find book, the two book fairs you do, do you find it still profitable in the sense of buying and selling? Oh, selling, it's definitely, for us, it works. Buying used to be, um, New York was never a good bu a book buying fair because the booths are more expensive here, and so people tend to bring their most expensive books. Um, Boston used to be the, we would come home from Boston with five cartons of books. And the last time we did Boston, it was just barely one box of books. That's, that's quite a difference. Right. That's quite a difference. Well, thank you very much for participating. Okay. You've been great. I enjoyed it quickly. very much. And um, go back and sell some books. Okay. <laughs>